RenManMusicAndBusiness.com. My name is Steve Rennie. I am the Renman, and this is Renman U Lesson 8, Marketing and Promotion. Today, we're going to be talking about how to stand out from the crowd in today's music business, how to craft your image with your music, photos, and videos. We're going to be talking about the key elements in a marketing plan, whether you're a major label or an indie artist, and how you can assemble them in a way that gives you the best chance of success. And of course, we'll be taking some questions along the way today in the chat room, in the studio, and online. So we'll get started here in a minute. Um, if this is your first time to Rent Man Youth, let me tell you what we're up to. Um, there are lots of people out there in schools who want to teach you the music business. But here's what I know. You can't learn the music business by reading a book. You learn it by doing. You learn it from people that have done it and succeeded in the music business. That's the best way. Renman U is my insider's guide to today's music business. Uh, I'm gonna share with you today all the lessons I've learned over 36 years of doing as a concert promoter, as a record executive, as an internet entrepreneur, and as an artist manager. I'm gonna teach you everything you need to know about today's music business, how to succeed in today's music business, not the fairy tale version, the real music business version, not that textbook version of the music business. So uh, if you're looking to do something great in the music business but need some help, you're in the right place here today. Um, here's what I want from you. I want you folks out there online to be a part of it. Uh, I want to know that you've got a burning desire to do something big in the music business. I want to know that you're willing to put in the work it takes to make that happen and that you really want to learn. Uh, and I've found over the years that the best way to learn anything is to ask questions. Uh, we've got a saying around here at the uh, World Headquarters, you don't ask, you don't get, and you don't learn. And that's our motto and we're going to stick to it today. So let me tell you how you can ask questions. If you're watching on the web today. You advanced planners can post your questions ahead of the time on our event page. I'll show you the graphic there. Um, go ahead, you got it? All right, there it is. Uh, you can post your questions also in the chat room during the broadcast. That's a great way to do it. And let me introduce our friend Michelle Wrightson over here to my left, who's going to tell you exactly how to do that. Michelle, take it away. Yes, hello, lovely people. You guys, please feel free to ask questions throughout the whole show and in general in the chat room, I will ask them to the Red Man himself. So yes, please don't be afraid. We love when you ask questions. Yes, we do. Uh, Michelle, you look very summery here today. Thank it's you. about 80 degrees here today. We have a few of our students that are ditching class, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, if you can't get us on the chat room and you haven't posted your question online, there's one other way to get in touch with us. You can move right to the front of the line by calling us on the Renman MB hotline at 310-469-9067. Move right to the front of the class. Um, in addition to you folks who are watching online, we have some folks that usually join us in here in the studio. As I said, uh, usually they usually have a nice turnout. It's very lovely outside today. I almost wanted to take the day off. So we're joined by one of our students today. The other three are going to be marked as absent today. Michelle, please take note of that, okay? Uh, so joining us in the studio today is a return customer. His name is? Uh, Nathan. Mm -hmm. Matthew, can you get Nathan on there just so we can see if we can get him on there? There's Nathan. Say hello, Nathan. You got him there, Code? Yeah, yeah, there we nice go. Shot. All right, perfect. He's wearing that fine Led Zeppelin shirt. <laughs> okay, now for the folks who haven't watched before, we know your name. What are you dreaming about doing in the music uh, business? Well, I'm coming to Closer slowly. Okay. All right, good, good, good stuff. All right, before we get started uh, into the program today, I wanted to tell you a little bit about. Oh, 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 oh! Sorry, thank you, Code. Jeez, my mind is wandering. Uh, one, it's interesting. The guys that were supposed to show up here didn't make it, except for Nathan. You, you get extra points here. But we do have one of our foreign exchange students online with us today, a young gentleman we've spoken to once before. We got him back here again today. Can you put him up on the monitor here, Code? Ah, oh, there he is. What's your name, there, sir? Hello, my name is Riley Seward, and I'm from the Bay Area. Where in the Bay Area? What Bay is that? Bay? Would it be San Francisco Bay yep, Area? San Francisco. Yep, San Francisco. Okay, you know, we, we take it for granted here. What's your name one more time, is it? My name's Riley. Riley, Riley. We take it for granted everybody lives in California, but they don't. That's the Bay Area up in San Francisco. Okay, what do you do, uh, Riley? I'm the manager of my best friend, Zach Osby, and I'm also uh, kind of a consultant for another musician. Okay, and you're in high school still? Yes, I'm a senior in high school. 
Wow, you're keeping busy already, my friend. I love that. That's good stuff, man. All right, so you know, I expect you to t pay attention. If you got some questions, you jump in, you know, signal Cody, and we'll get you working into the act. And I want to thank you for showing up here today, Riley. Yeah, no problem. Thank All you. Right, and I'll probably forget your name once or twice. So just work me through it. If I go go blank, just say, see, yell out your name. All right. All right, no worries. All right, great stuff. Um, you know, for you folks that don't know what we're doing, we started this website about 18 months ago. It's called Ren Man Music and Business. And I had a very simple idea. I wanted to help mentor this next generation of artists and music professionals and do my best to help navigate them around today's music business. And over the course of the last 18 months, we've had the opportunity to speak to almost 100 of the smartest, most talented people in the music business. And uh, I want to share all all that knowledge with you. We'll do some of that during the show here today. Um, uh, let's see, what else is going on? Um, as I mentioned, those 100 people have turned our site into, I think, really the greatest resource uh, uh, on the web for music knowledge. I'll be referencing a lot of those folks today, so I want to encourage you before you go any further to dig down deep into that website, click the links, spend some time there, and you are bound to learn something. Uh, with one condition. Before you do that, you'll need to join our community. Um, it's easy to do. You just go to our webpage and click register. Uh, we got a brand new registration set up. Hopefully that makes it a little bit easier for you. Also it tells me what you're interested in. And over the course of the next few weeks and months, we're gonna be dialing in some promotions that allow you not only to think about the music business, but to actually get involved doing some projects along the way. Um, now, there's always something happening here at Renman MB. So the best way to keep in touch with us is on our social media channels. Real quick, I'll run you through those. If you're a Twitter fan, you can reach us at RenmanMB. Uh, if you're a Facebook fan, ditto at RenmanMB. Uh, if you're on uh, YouTube, RenmanMB. And if you like pictures of dogs and behind the scenes, you can also get us on Instagram at, at RenmanMB. Okay, now that we've taken care of all that business, let's get started. Um, now that you've made this music, if you're a musician we're speaking to out there now, uh, that music needs to be heard, it wants to be heard, and you gotta make it happen. And that's where this whole idea of marketing and promotion comes into the mix. Um, the decisions you make on marketing and promotion will have a huge impact on whether that music of yours is commercially viable. Think back to our lesson four when we talked about treating your career as a business. Is it viable? Can it make you a living? Um, this whole idea of marketing is really about telling your story. Um, artists today have an unprecedented ability to tell their own story out there in today's world. But there's also an unprecedented amount of music vying for your attention as well. Uh, so my goal today is to give you a top level view of what you should be thinking about when it comes to marketing and promoting your music. And then we'll focus on the things that you can reasonably achieve on your own to tell your story in the most compelling way possible uh, and, and to, to give yourself the best chance to, to, to stand out from the crowd. Um, all right, so that begs the question, so what does it take to stand out from the crowd today? Uh, Nathan, you're a musician, a composer. Uh, what do you think it takes to stand out from the crowd today amongst all that vast amounts of music being made out there? Oh, I think it takes a... Speak into the mic, please. Probably being recommended by someone higher up than you. Okay. Pass along type word of mouth. Okay, maybe an influence or something or like that. A blogger, even. Okay, a blogger. Uh, we have Riley online. Riley, you there with us? Yeah, give me one sec. We're going to bring him in real quick. Hold on. Okay. Riley, can you hear the question? How, what do you think it takes to stand out from the crowd? You're a manager. I think it's really important to have a, a story that you go off of and have a unique sound, but definitely knowing kind of who your audience is and targeting them uh, when you're making your music, I think is the most important thing. Targeting them when you're making your music or after you've made the music? Well, both, but I think, you know, you have to be making something that your audience wants. So both on the creation standpoint and then also marketing, you know, uh, afterwards. Okay. All right. So those are some good thoughts. Let me give you a couple other things to think about. To compete at the top levels of the music industry, um, it takes great music, obviously, to start with. Um, I think it takes a team of experienced and well-connected professionals to manage and execute a plan to get your word out. Um, in many cases, it takes an infrastructure to address all the key areas of the marketing mix. Typically, it takes a lot of money. And so in the past, that's usually typically meant a major label. Um, 
People ask me all the time, so what does it cost to market a record, Steve? Um, for major label marketing budgets can range anywhere from a few thousand dollars into the millions of dollars for big artists. And it all depends on the mix and the magnitude of the key marketing elements that you throw into the mix. So how can you artists that are watching out there today, you got a question? Let no, me... we got an answer, which oh, I really thought oh, was fine. great. That's fine, weigh in. What's his yeah. name, person? Uh, Brazil, Brazilian drums. Brazilian drums. He says, or she, go against the grain and be a trendsetter in your own overall style. I think that's what's really making artists stand out today, just going against what people think is the norm. I like it. And so. I think that speaks to what we were talking about earlier, Riley. When you're, If you think about marketing when you're making music too much, Michelle and I were talking about yeah. it before we started here today. I'm not sure that's a great idea. I think you go, as we talked about when we talked about making music last week, you want to make something that's true to who you are, right? Mm -hmm. And typically, the artists that set the trends are ahead of where the music business is in right. a given moment. So yeah. I think it's Brazilian hands is on the right track there. And that's not to, to disagree with you, Riley, but you're a man manager, right? And the manager's yes. job is to take what that artist has given them and give it its best shot in the real world. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay, perfect. So um, you got a question there, Code? All right, great. So how can you folks out there compete in today's music business, I suppose, is the question of the day. And I'm going to give you a couple things to think about. The first thing you need to figure out, okay, if you're an indie artist out there today, is what your target is. We've talked about it in previous sessions. Let me explain what I mean. Um, are you looking to build a sustainable niche, right? You're doing something that's really unique that doesn't have big commercial potential and you know it. Maybe you're doing... I don't know, fusion, electronic, country, jazz, you know, reggae music, something that doesn't have a lot of appeal. Um, if you're okay with that and you don't care about being part of big time success, then all you'll really need to do is make music that's true to who you are, and then you'll need to go out and try to build and cultivate a loyal fan base around your niche, right? And lots of people have done that and lots of people are okay with that. Um, I think if you want to compete at the highest levels of the music business, you have visions of holding up a Grammy Award or selling millions of records or playing stadium rock shows, then we're talking about a slightly different animal. Uh, and in that case, the things you're doing now as an indie artist could reasonably be called product development in any other business. So the things you're doing, crafting your songs, crafting your image, you know, dialing in the look and feel of your records and stuff, that's stuff you can do on your own and if you do get signed to a major label one day they will appreciate your clarity in terms of defining who you are as an artist it makes their job easier um, what are your resources out there that's the second thing you got to think about what do I have to work with okay uh, money is 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 one of the most important ones do you have any at all if you don't have money how will you get it um, this money has an impact on just about everything you do from recording to marketing if you have money you have more options if you don't have money then you need to be creative right um, one of the things you need to ask yourself in terms of resources is do you have any kind of professional team? We talked about that in, uh, in session three here. Uh, do you have a manager? Do you have an agent? Do you have a marketing person that can help you along the way? Um, if you don't have the, that experience, do you have the money to help rent that experience? Um, do you have contacts in the industry that once you've made that music, as you were talking about here, Nathan, that can help you introduce you, influence other people? Those are all key things to think about. And you really need to be honest about it to, uh, to, to have a real shot. So. Um, I think if you're going to be out there today trying to compete as an indie artist, you need to make it a very personal affair. Why? Because uh, if you don't have a lot of money, you'll need to make your approach extremely, extremely personal because you're going to be the one doing all the work. You'll be the one making the calls. You'll be the one sending the e emails. You'll be the one maintaining the website. Um, for those of you folks that, 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 that want a little inspiration on that notion of making it personal, if you go to the website code, uh, we'll put it up there real quick for all you folks watching. If you go to
to the website on our on our homepage. We have a section there called the feed, and there's a uh, there there it is uh, down in the left corner. There is a thing called a big picture. Go check out a video called Making It Personal, where I talk about this whole this whole idea of making it personal. And while you're there, you should check out one more. It's uh, it's chapter two. It's called Fuck the Gatekeepers because you're going to need a new attitude as an indie artist out there today competing against all these other folks. And that attitude is, hey, fuck the gatekeepers. I'm going to make something happen no matter how many challenges are in, in my face at any given moment, right? Um, I want to give you a, a little big picture thought and play you a video that hopefully will get you inspired. It's from a gentleman uh, by the name of Jay Bober, who's is an old friend of mine, one of my oldest friends in the music business. He's run record labels, music publisher. He's now working in, as a chairman of InGrooves, uh, which is a big digital distribution house. His whole thought is things don't happen today. I'm going to play you this clip, and there's a little overview to what we're doing today, and then we're going to get started. Take it away, Code. The other thing that's relevant about IRS versus you know, uh, you know, 30 years ago versus today is that it's not about trying to do everything at once. It's about coming up with achievable goals. You know, when we signed Oingo Boingo as an LA band, I said, okay, well, let's just break LA. Let's figure out how do we get the community, the music community to support them, the, the, the media community to support them? How do we build a fan base? And you sort of went from there, that sort of concentric circles. And when I signed to REM, they were out of Athens and they had really not played anywhere outside of the South. I think the furthest west they'd gone was New Orleans, if I'm not mistaken. And, and so we said, okay, let's just focus on the South. It's about having small victories that sort of validate your passion. And they, not, they may not be victories that are so big that the whole world sees it immediately, but they're victories that show that you're on the right track. You generate a bit of revenue, yeah. you get some things going on that mm. sort of gives you that momentum and really fuels you. All right, Jay Bober, great interview there, folks. And at the risk of sounding like a shameless promoter for all the content, one of the things that I've realized in terms of marketing and promotion, you can have a great product, but if you haven't done a great job of letting people know about it, uh, it's like the tree that fell in the forest. And that interview we did with Jay Bober was one of the very first people, Michelle, that I interviewed on the show. It was a terrific interview. You'll forgive us for all the lack of production values, but it's really great stuff if you're talking about trying to get your, your head on straight. Jay Bobry has some wonderful thoughts. I encourage you to go check that out. If you go to the live section on our website, you click up at that live tab up there. Uh, it's one of the very first interviews we did. Okay, let's talk about now the key elements of your marketing plan. Whether you're a major label or you're an indie artist, these are the essential elements that every person in the record business needs to think about. Uh, we're going to talk about those, and then we're going to talk about within the context of those elements, what are the things that you can reasonably do on your own today without a big pocket full of money. Okay, here's the key elements. I'll just list them for you, then we'll talk about them in detail. The key elements are number one, first and foremost, music. It all starts with the music. We've said it a million times, I'll say it one more time. Presentation is important. Creating your image, you do it through your, your words, your videos, your photography, all of those elements come together. They're called presentation, they shape your image. Um, part of that key element in the marketing plan is identifying who your customers are, as uh, Riley mentioned. Um, touring is a big part of that marketing uh, plan. That's where you meet your customers. That's one of the few places you meet your customers and your, your supporters face to face. It's not an email, it's a real person there. Publicity, how are you gonna hear about your music? How are you gonna hear about your tours? That's all about publicity. Distribution, if you made the great music Music, you're starting to get the word out. People want to get their hands on it. Well, distribution is the thing that allows them to actually buy it. Um, you, once you've made that music, you want to get to be heard. And that typically means getting on the radio. Um, almost every song is accompanied by, or at least a song on an album, is accompanied by a visual, a video. Um, in the old days, that was MTV. Today, it's a whole different animal. But getting a visual to your songs is an important part of the mix. And then finally, online promotion is really, was back in the old days of the record business, it was kind of like a little ghetto. Today, now, it infects every single thing we do in the music business, from making the music, to selling the music, to distributing the music. Those are the key elements of the plan. Now, let's talk about it from the top here. Let's talk about the music uh, first. Uh, first about making the music, and then about what happens when you are done making the music. And Riley and, and uh, Nathan, you guys jump in. If you got any great uh, questions in the chat room, jump right in, Michelle. Um, 
Let's talk about making the music. All of this happens, that making of the music happens well ahead of the marketing and promotion typically, okay? And there's a whole process that goes along while that, while that music is being made. First, you start with writing songs, right? Um, and at that very first level, before he is, what Brandon O'Brien talked about, he sits down with his artists before they make a record, he reviews the songs, maybe rearranges things or adds and, or deletes what they need, and they come up with a list of songs that hopefully fit the bill. So you gotta know, do you have enough songs? Are those the songs as great as you can make them? Once you've got some songs written, then you're gonna need to record those songs, and the budget will have a huge impact. Who you work with will have a huge impact on that the musicians you play with will have a huge impact on that um, once you've recorded those songs mixing the songs becomes a really important part of the mix as well I'll give you an example band writes a song it's four minutes and 54 seconds and radio is playing 330 to 345 typically what will happen is you go into a record label or you might be thinking yourself maybe I need to have an edit maybe that instrumental bit in the middle might keep me from getting played so that mix how it all plays out, how the vocals sound, and all the things getting in the prop word is part of that mixing. And then finally, the final part of that process, which I've never really understood, is mastering the songs. But I do know this, once the mastering is done, the gavel's down, the music's in the can, and the marketing process starts. So, what happens once those songs are done? You need to think about the following items. Um, you need to identify whether you will release a single an EP or an album. Now in the old days, it was typically you released an album, you released a single before it, but it's changing today in a big way. Lots of record labels, lots of artists are not going with a full album anymore. They might start with a single or they might start with a three or four or five song EP to kind of get the ball rolling a little bit. So those are the decisions you need to make uh, when you're done making that music and you have a whole you know, uh, bag of songs. Um, you'll need to select the songs to be included on each of those formats. So if it's single, it's easy, you pick one. If it's an EP and it's five songs, you pick five. If it's a four song, you get where I'm going with that. If it's a full album, you, today you might be deciding whether I need to fill my whole CD with 15 songs or with 10, 11 great ones, okay? Those are the decisions that make after, you, know, you make after you've made the music. Um, identifying, here's the most important one in the context of the record biz, identifying what song you will lead with because that will likely be a single as we typically characterize it in the business or at the very least will be the same song you make that video for because you can record a bunch of songs. Very few people have enough money and resources to make a bunch of videos. Uh, and finally, you'll need to determine what configurations you're going to release that record in. Are you going to release it in vinyl for the 2% or 1% of the people that need to have vinyl? Are you going to release it on CD, which requires you to actually put out cash um, to get all kinds of artwork, assets, and so forth together? Um, requires you to purchase all that upfront money out of your pocket that you could spend on something else? Or are you going to just release it on digital, where there is no cost of inventory, there is no cost of manufacturing, you turn over a file and it's around the world? Those are big decisions that all have a huge impact in what's going on. Questions so far? Anything? Riley, any questions so far? Do you have a question? So uh, when you're releasing, let's say, a full album, I know in the past it used to be, you know, one day the album wasn't released and then the next day it was. But I've seen recently a lot of people are, will re release like a single beforehand or let you stream a song beforehand. Uh, do you have any advice for that? I think what people are doing is, you know, in the old days, the album, first week sales and all that was everything. So you kind of tended to shake up the bottle, right? And then it exploded big. I think what's happened over the years through leaks and so forth and so on is that music has gotten out there ahead of your release date. And so what's happening now is labels and smart managers and artists are thinking about, you know, how they want to get the buzz going about a song because songs typically take longer to play out today. Um, there was a song that my son was playing, you know, at his fraternity years ago. What is that? Mimosa, Doses. Doses and Mimosas. So he was hearing a year and a half ago that's just now getting on the radio here in Los Angeles, California. My son's over it, but all the people that just discovered it today, it's brand new. So 
the length that that the fact that that process is lengthened out a bit is giving everybody you know some thought about how best to do it. I think what you want to have happen is once a song comes out, you want it to stick around for as long as possible. So yeah. if you can start it with a single. Uh, great. If you start something with an EP that ultimately grows into an album that extends the life of that conversation about the music, great. Um, the best example I can give you right now is Imagine Dragons, who had a single and then a couple of EPs and then an album and all of that stuff. And the biggest song on the album turned out to be a song that was on the original EP. Yeah. All right. That help you out? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. All right, All right I've perfect. I've got a question from the chat room. Question from the chat room, yes. fire away. Derek Tucker, what are the drawbacks to releasing only in digital format? The, the drawbacks are that there are still people out there that like having a physical disc. You know, ironically, I'm not one of those people. <laughs> I, I came from the generation of LPs and cassettes and, God, 8-tracks, I can remember it all. I prefer digital just because it's easier. But there are people, probably 50, 60 percent of the market, in some places it's higher, is still physical. So you're giving up some sales there. Um, one of the advantages, if you're an indie artist, of not doing uh, uh, physical is you don't have the cost of manufacturing and inventory, right? Um, but if you're playing gigs, then you won't have an opportunity to sell it at the counter there when somebody's mm. feeling great about it, but you might be able to hand them a card that allows them to go to a website and download it. So um, I think the downside is people still want it. You know, some chunk of people still want it, um, and, you're, and you're not satisfying those folks, but I think there's some things on the other side that outweigh that. Any other questions in there? Yeah, uh, Freedom91.1. Should the artist wait and let the label create his image, photos, name, artwork, or should they do everything by themselves before getting to sign a label? But I think I think it's a great question. Yeah. Okay, and I'll answer it this way: If you have a label deal in front of you, and you haven't sorted out all that stuff ahead of time, trust me when I tell you. What's <laughs> the name again? Um, Freedom. Freedom. Okay, <laughs> trust me when I tell you, Freedom. When you go inside a label, there'll be no, sh no shortage of people that'll want to tell you how to do your job, right? Um, I think the problem comes in is when people are telling you to do something or be something that's not really who you are. So um, that's why I, I tell you that if you're an indie artist that's just starting off today and you haven't been invited to sign to a major label, take some time to think about who you really are, who your true north is. Go back through some of our other lessons where we talk about that stuff. Figure out who it is you really are and make sure that your videos and your songs and your album covers and your photographs all are, are adding up to who you really want to be. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. Got one more for One you. more question. Love yes. it. Thanks for all yeah, you everybody. folks that showed up in the chat room today. Let me just say thank you very much. I love that. Okay. <laughs> we got a, uh, ooh, it keeps on writing. NJ Taylor Official. I've been working on my debut album, and my goal was to record a full LP, which is 10 songs, but now I'm unsure if that's the right move. Is it best to release an EP first or an LP? Well, we just talked about that a little bit. Here's the good news. If you've got 10 songs, NJ, you still got your 10 songs, okay? Yeah. Uh, in the old record business, I'll refer to it uh, fondly, um, you would have put all 10 of those songs on an album. You would have picked the first single. You would have gone to radio, and if it didn't work, the rest of those nine songs would have been wasted. Everybody would have stopped talking about right. your album. That was the old business. Today, the big labels, the smart labels, the little labels are all taking a slightly different tack, putting out a single, seeing if they can get some little wins, okay? Then putting out an EP that makes it brand new. So it's the old song and maybe three or four new ones. And so now you're brand new again, right? Um, and if that works out reasonably well, then you put out a full album and those albums can include the tracks that you've already released. At iTunes, they allow you to buy the rest of the album, right? right. Or whatever it is. Um, so you're not wasting those songs. You're just thinking about how to lengthen the conversation. I liken it to, you know, the, the, in, sometimes in a hospital, you know, they'll put a patient in a coma, self-induced coma, in the hopes that they can kind of ice them down while they try to figure out how to cure them. I think it's the same thing is true in the record business. So what you're thinking about is good, NJ. Um, 
the right, there's no right or wrong answer to anything in the music business. It's, it's a feel thing, but just take comfort in knowing that some of the smartest, most powerful labels around are thinking about the very same things you're thinking about, and they're putting out singles, EPs, and then albums. I hope that answers your question, okay? Uh, all right, presentation. Let's talk about presentation, this whole idea of building your image. Um, presentation ultimately comes down to your music, your songs, the how those songs play out, the packaging around your album, artwork, and so forth and so on. Uh, your photos have a huge impact on your image, right? Ask, ask Lady Gaga, she'll huh. tell you. Um, and your videos also have a huge impact. Your photos are used in your press and your website. They, they get it right because they'll stick around with you forever. Your videos, you'll use an online outlet. You use those for press and also a way for people just to see the whole package, the song. They want to see what you look like. They want to see how you perform. So let's start with photos. Photos. You know, if that old saying is true, a picture is worth a thousand words. If that's true, then hopefully you got a great picture that starts to tell the thousand words of your story that you were looking to tell, right? Um, labels spend tons of money on the top photographers to do this, right? Um, you folks will likely have to do it on your own without the benefit of one of those big name photographers. Um, so what should you be looking for, right? Um, I want to introduce you to one of our guests. Well, I talked about it at the top that we've had so many smart talented people on our web show. And one of them was a gentleman by the name of Brantley Gutierrez. I had a chance to work with Brantley over the years with my friends in Incubus. He's worked with top artists like Foo Fighters, Arcade Fire, U2, Paul McCartney, Eric Clapton, amongst others. Um, I asked him during that interview, and I'll share with you, what his advice would be for indie artists like yourselves that are watching, that are thinking about how to craft their own image in the photo, uh, in the photo motif. So here's what he had to say. Uh, he said, you really have to be aware of how you want, you want to put that in the, in the broadcast there, Cud? The slide? Oh, you can't. Okay. I'll just read it to you, folks. We'll go old school. <laughs> Here's what he had to say. You really have to be aware of how you want to present yourself because you only have a short window of time to make an impression these days because everybody's attention span is so short, people are judging things very, very quickly. It benefits an artist to really think about the whole idea of how they want their art to be. Does that make sense to you, Michelle? Yes, 100%. How about you, Riley Online? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. All right. So for you folks that, you know, I just read you a little clip. Right? Go check out that interview with Brantley Gutierrez that Cody just showed you there. Again, pardon our presentation or lack thereof. We were early in our webcasting career. I think it was shortly after doing that broadcast that we decided to go out buy cameras, real lights, and microphones. So I apologize to Brantley. I hope he's not watching today. Um, Making videos, that's the other great part of building your image. That's the one that everybody seems to have fun with. They all like going out and making movies, I find. Um, getting a great video is an important part of shaping your image. A great video can add to a song by providing these compelling images. I can think of over the years um, great songs that were enhanced and really magnified by great videos. I can also think of some pretty good songs that suffered you know, mightily at the hands of a horrible video. So it's important to get those things right. Now, when it comes to big labels, if you're on a big label, easy. They have a lot of access to the top directors in the business because they're making videos all the time. They're in contact with all the top production companies who provide access to those directors. And more importantly, they have the money to pay for all that stuff. Now, you lot out there watching today are not quite so lucky uh, because you won't, have to have a, you won't have a big budget, so it'll be important for you folks to be creative. You'll have to pull off one of these mind over money uh, things that I, that I love to talk about. And for the record, I have seen some unbelievably great videos that are being made out there in today's world for no money. And the answer for that is really simple. The equipment that you can get your hands on today has leveled the playing field. Just what we have in our, uh, our studio here today, you know, SD cameras, the, the, the Canon 5D Mark III camera, which if you can't buy one, you can certainly rent one in almost every city in the world, gives you a cinematic feel that's just off the charts, okay? And you have access to all that stuff. So what you need now is a great idea. The equipment side of it has gotten a little bit easier, but you'll still need somebody to help you pull it off, and that's typically a video director. Um, 
as I mentioned, we've talked to a lot of smart people here on the site. We had a chance to talk to a really smart guy by the name of Jordan Bahat, who not only is an SC grad, I'm happy to report another fine Trojan. He's also becoming one of the top video directors around. He's worked with acts like Group Love, Fits in the Tantrum, uh, My Friends in Fun, and more. Um, I encourage you to go check out our interview we did with him, but I asked him for some advice um, to, 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 to give some advice to young indie artists like yourselves that are thinking about making that first video. And here's what he had to say. He said, you need to be honest with who you are. You need to stay in your own style. You need to figure out what it is you like and what your vibe is and move forward from there. So his whole thought was it's okay to take some risk. You know, it's okay to try to, he, he encourages you to be creative and to make something where the video adds a lot to the song. But from there, it's not rock and science. You're just kind of figuring out who you are and trying to capture that and, and trying to add a dose of clever into the mix there. Um, Easy to say, how do you find a director out there, okay? Used to be, you had to go to these big video production companies to make it happen. You had to have 50, 60, 100,000 million dollars to make a video. Not true anymore today. Again, is part of our web show. I had a chance to speak with a website called RadarMusicVideos.com. Um, what these people do is it says right there, we connect talented music, connect talented video directors that want to make videos with artists and labels, small artists and labels that are looking to have a video made. Their top budget, I believe, is $7,000. The lowest budget you can get by is $800, right? Um, and I have seen some unbelievable videos. We don't have time to show you today the video, but if you watch that clip online, you'll see there's a great video in there uh, called Blackbirds by a young band in uh, Miami, Florida called Artificial. And I heard about Radar Music Videos through their manager, young uh, manager guy that had contacted me very early on in our Renman MB days. Um, so you have some ways to go and make a great video happen for not a lot of money today that just wasn't there years ago, okay? Any questions so far? Riley? Yeah, question. Riley, I love it, man. <laughs> hey, Riley, are, are you doing so your homework right now or are you ditching class? Um, I'll be doing homework later. All but, right. I bet you um, will. Can you throw them so in the and I have so been I can see enough. a smiling mug code? Yeah. Sorry about that. There you okay. go. Now I can see it. Hear me? Yep, I can see you now, too. All right, Zach and I have been lucky enough to make a lot of music videos for his top songs. But for the rest of the album, do you recommend just putting, like, you know, uh, the song still up on YouTube with, like, an album picture? Or do you think you should only post something on YouTube if you have an actual video to go along with it? I, I got to tell you, I think that's a that's a great question, Riley. And I think, you know, as a grisly old veteran of the music business, if you'd asked me five years ago, I would have told you you'd make a video, a real video for every song. What's yeah. happening today is that YouTube is becoming one of the greatest streaming music platforms in the world. It's almost like a radio station. I'm watching my son, Matt, here and his friend who watch and listen to music all day long on YouTube, which are essentially an image with the song. Right. Yeah. Uh, when Brandon and boy put out a, a, a solo record this past uh, year um, we made a bunch of lyric videos okay which wasn't a big expensive video it was lyrics playing along with it but I've wa watched I should say watch slash listen to lots of songs online um, that are just an image in the music so I say you can do both of them and lots of people are in fact most people are now so it's it's the way the business has evolved and it's all about the online revolution that people like yourselves and other young artists are doing things differently than we did in the old record business because they can and because they have to. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right. Let's save up another question. Riley, you're doing great. You got an A so far, man. Mm -hmm. If you need a you need to get back in class letter, I'll be happy to provide one. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. The next part of that key element of a marketing plan is identifying who are your fans or potential fans. That's a key item here, right? If you want to sell something in this world, no matter what business you're in, you need to identify. First, you got to come up with something that's worth buying, right? And then you need to identify who the buyers might actually be. So how can you do that? In the music business, one of my favorite tricks over the years when you were describing a band or a band was trying to describe themselves were musical reference points. I recall when I first met Incubus and was explaining to my boss what were they like, right? I said, well, they're somewhere between Corn and Rage Against the Machine and Santana 
an average white band. And he said, geez, that sounds freaking horrible, right? <laughs> but it's a time-honored way. It's these reference points. If I ask you, who do you, who are some reference points for you, Michelle Wrightson? <laughs> Uh, a mix between, well, ultimately, I want to be the female Bruno Mars. Okay, all right. Uh, some okay. Adele, some Sarah Bareilles. Okay, all right, so you, you follow, yeah, that's something that you're comfortable with. Everybody kind of think does that what, one way or another. How about you, Nathan? Uh, I guess I'd say some composers like John Cage and even Stravinsky. And okay. Real, real composers. Okay, gotcha. Okay. All right, so if musical reference points is one. You can do it by demographics and psychographics. I love psychographics. You know, it's like trying to figure out what people are interested in. I've been doing some advertising recently on Google, and it's all about, you know, demographics, you know, how old they are, male, female, you know, what age range they're in, where they're located, their interests are, are starts to speak to psychographics and all that kind of stuff. So you can start to get these personalities profiles of who you think might listen to your music, right? If you see a guy in a cowboy hat and cowboy boots, you immediately think, well, he must be a country music mm -hmm. fan, right? Um, so anyway, those are some ways you can do it. Um, that's uh, we're moving along. Um, now, once you've kind of gotten a handle on who you think your customers are or might be, then you're going to want to find, uh, figure out how to find them. And that's, again, where you can use all these tricks of the trade today I love on YouTube and Twitter, your email list, almost every website that it requires, you know, where you can gather some membership information. You can get information on location and all that kind of stuff. So you can market to those people based on all this information you can get back. And by the way, you guys have the same tools at your disposal at, at a basic level that all the major labels have, Google Analytics and all of that stuff they might be able to buy a little bit deeper but the punchline is they're looking for indicators of who their audience are and you should be looking as well um, we talked about these sources can be gleaned from all kinds of places social media gives you information soundcloud i love because not only to tell who's listening and where they can actually start to mark in your song where they're feeling it and where where you're kind of losing so those are all great things that tell you who your customers are um, so one of the reasons, you know, we talk about ways to see your customers and get a feel for who they are. One of the things that's great about touring is that's one of the few places you can actually see and meet your customers there. So let's talk about touring now. Um, for me, certainly, as a manager of a rock band, and I think for anybody that aspires to have a live music career, right, um, touring is a key part of your marketing plan. It's the purest expression, in my mind, of your songs and performances. I talk all the time about the business is really down to songs and great performances, and the concert business is where those things come together. Uh, as I mentioned, it's one of the few places you meet your customer face-to-face -face is at a concert. Um, it's a gathering point for all your marketing efforts, whether, whether it's press, you know, you're in a market and they come down to write about your show or write about your album and then write that you're coming to town. It's a place where radio that's playing your songs uh, can say, hey, they're playing tonight. Or if you're trying to get radio play, you call up and you say, hey, we're playing in your market. Come down and send somebody from the radio station. It's where those retail promotions, where you can sell your record and do all kinds of offers. All of those things, these marketing elements come together around tour dates. Um, it can also be the most expensive marketing tool you have as well. So for the big boys, the big labels, they have big budgets for tour support, or not, not as big as they used to be, but they will support uh, and pay money to have a band on the road that's losing money because they can execute all these other you know, marketing efforts. Um, they can, a a well-funded label can get their artists out of their local area, both nationally and internationally, because it may just be a matter of writing a check. Um, Big labels have access to managers, agents, and promoters because they're dealing with big time acts. So they can, it's easier for them to dial a brand new act that they signed in. They can call up a manager, hey, Red, are you interested in managing this band or whoever it might be? Uh, and that increases their, their ability to get that band out on the road. And what the labels also have is this ability to coordinate around the tour, that press, radio, marketing, and sales that we just talked about. So. You're not on a label, so what does that mean to you? Who cares, right? <laughs> what can you folks do today with your touring piece of the marketing plan? Well, 
You can start, take the advice of my friend Jay Bober, you can start and build from your local market and you can build those concentric circles. You can figure out how to sell out shows in your home market. If you're not selling out those show, shows in your home market, you gotta ask yourself, are your songs good enough? Is your performance good enough? Do you need to be working on those things? Because if you're succeeding in selling tickets in your marketplace, that makes it easier to get outside your hometown. Um, if you're working on your performance, great. People are going to be coming to your show. So, you know, that's, that's how that works. You want to use all those online tools out there to work around not having a manager uh, or an agent. For example, there's a site. We're going to talk about all these artist tools, uh, some of these artist tools that we've we've had a chance to become aware of. There's a great one called Indie on the Move. That's a great site built by uh, a, former, um, a former musician himself who put together listings of clubs and buyers and so forth in every city around America that gives somebody that's looking to build a touring business outside their home market uh, the benefits of almost having an agent. You still got to make the call. You still got to do the deals, but it gives you some resources there. Um, so yeah, I want you to use, there's all kinds of tools out there on the web, whether it's Bandpage, whether it's Reverb Nation, Bandzoogle, almost all these websites in a box have the ability to help you post your concert dates, uh, to help you promote your concert dates and all that. So those are the things that you can do today, even without a big manager, without a big promoter or an agent, right? But they require that you actually be building a live business, i.e. you're showing up, you're playing, and more people are coming back, okay? Uh, any questions so far, Mr. Riley, the manager? Yes. Fire um, away. Kind of going off of that, um, I, I know online, Zach and I, have put, I've, like I posted all of Zach's stuff on you know, Spotify, stuff like that. We have a website, SoundCloud, but um, I'm kind of wondering what are websites where Zach's music can get discovered? Because right now, the only people looking up Zach's music are people who know him or me. And I'm trying to figure out like a, some sort of website or platform that lets people who are not familiar with Zach uh, find his music. Just find his music, not performance stuff. Oh, yeah, sorry. Th this was going back to what you were saying uh, okay. right before the tour. About performance. Okay. Um, that's yeah, a, yeah. That's a, so you find out, you, make sure I understand because I was lost my, you're, you're, he's out performing, you're trying to figure out where he can get discovered doing that? Or is it just putting his music out there? Well, I would say right now, all of our online views come from people who have seen him perform. I'm trying to figure out how we can get people who have not seen him perform, still discover his music online. Got it. Okay. There are some great resources out there for that as well. When you, here's the thing about when you do a live date. Um, typically, you do it if it's in front of 20 people, it doesn't get any bigger than that. It's those 20 people and who they might tell, right? So you're yeah. kind of locked into a location. There's a number of new things that have happened out there in the last few years. Uh, a site called Stage It, right? That's a platform where you know you build some fans and you can actually charge them. Now that would require that they know who you are. There's a great site. I'm going to meet with these guys tomorrow. A site in in, uh, in Chicago called Day Trotter. Uh, dot TV. And what they are is a website that puts on, that will actually film concerts with bands that aren't that well known yet. Okay. Audio, audio. audio sorry, audiotree.tv, excuse me, right? Um, that put on concerts and they present them, they shoot them in great quality. Now you have to be coming through Chicago, but by and large, most of the artists that they have on the site are quote unquote unknown, but they have some spectacularly great artists that are there. So those yeah. are some new ways uh, to do it. Uh, we, we were talking about Day Trotter is the site that's outside of Chicago, somewhere in the Midwest, where they will actually record your concert, not video, but they'll record it in a studio. So you have this ability to get a live recording of just the audio and a live recording of your performance. You still have to pitch those guys to get you know, to hopefully have a chance to do it. I was talking with some folks the other day that we're going to feature on the site here shortly. There, it's a, a, a organization called Songs from a Room that was started in London, England. They have chapters in 40, 50 cities around the world now where they take people and bring them into a, a space the size of my office and have young, undiscovered artists put on concerts and they tape those, right? So even though lots of people aren't there at that one moment, they're enthusiastic fans, but those views are 
are multiplied madly online because people are coming to this website to discover new music. So those are some of the things that weren't there when I started off in the business. When I started off in the business, you had to get a guy like me to book you, pay you, and promote you, or you weren't. It wasn't happening. So those are some places. I don't know if you get discovered, but you, you, you have a chance to show up in front of more people and it, and it leverages one performance well beyond that on a worldwide basis. Does that, that help? Yes, thank you. All right, great. Uh, any questions, Nathan? You're, more, you're not so much into the performing as just composing, right? All right, great. Um, all right, so RMB resource, Rayman resources for you guys to do some homework. As I mentioned, we got all kinds of great content on our site. If you go to the front page of our site, I am just driving my, oh, Cody's doing so well. Let's go to the homepage, right? <laughs> if you go to that homepage of our site, scroll up. Oh, he's, you're doing so well today, Code. And you click on, what are we talking about? Touring over there, right? If you click on that link of touring, you will have in front of you all kinds of interviews with agents, managers, promoters, venue operators, all of whom are going to tell you about their take on the live touring business. And if you can't learn something there, uh, I'm not sure what else I can do for him. <clears throat> Maybe we can send you to college. I don't know. All right. Uh, that's it for touring. Another key part of your marketing program is publicity. Publicity is all about getting people to talk about you. You made a record, you made a video, you're going on tour, you're doing all kinds of clever events. Who's going to talk about it? That, that's publicity. Publicity is the tool for you to tell your story. Um, who are the targets? Typically, the targets are national publications, you know, the Rolling Stones, the big publications, you know, People Magazine, whatever it might be. Um, there are influences. Somebody earlier talked about influence. Wouldn't it be great if somebody with great influence found you and talked about you to somebody else? The great story recently is Lord was putting out a record down in uh, New Zealand when she very first started. Uh, I was at a meeting with some folks from Spotify, and Spotify now has some wonderful networking abilities built into the to their, their application now. And anyway, um, Sean Parker, the guy from Facebook, had heard about Lord. He put it on his Spotify playlist, right? And all of a sudden, bang, millions of people around the world who followed his playlist were now listening to Lord, and it helped get the ball rolling on her. So that, is that publicity? I, it kind of skirts it, but it's all about the influencers, daily newspapers, the LA Times, the New York Times, all your local newspapers that write about albums, that write about performances when you come down, they're still part of the mix. TV shows. Uh, we all know about, you know, the Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Fallon and all of these guys, right? Those are shows that have typically been the, the bulwark of online or TV performances for bands, great places to be seen. Uh, shows like Oprah, you know, not so much Oprah anymore, uh, you know, Ellen DeGeneres and some of these talk shows are, are more and more featuring artists, not only talking, but playing. Um, blogs is the new, is the new 800 pound gorilla. You know, send 10 years ago with just some freaky kids in their college room, you know, writing online and nobody watching. Today, sites like Pitchfork have all the weight, perhaps more than the likes of Rolling Stone back in the day. Podcasts, here we're doing podcasts. We've had artists and executives want to come on our podcast. They're all new ways of communicating. These are all the new targets out there. The publicist is typically the person that handles that stuff. And the publicist <coughs> is the person or persons that call on the media. Okay, they're the ones sending the emails, writing the letters, banging on the phone. Um, what publicists need is a steady stream of what they call items. They need things to talk about, right? So if you call up a publicist and say, will you handle my publicity? The first thing they're going to ask is, well, what do you have going on? What do you have that's noteworthy, or that's worth writing about? And, and you need to think about that stuff because sometimes you have to manufacture those items to keep the conversation going. So you, you're always going to need new angles to tell your story. Is it a single? Is it a concert? Is it an album? Is it a performance on TV? Is it something cool you did? Those are all the things you'll need to, to think about. Um, in terms of doing some homework, I encourage you to go check out our REN 101 section on the front page of our website. Click on the uh, REN 101 about publicists. That's my take on what a publicist does. But if you're really looking to do some homework, I encourage you to check out an interview with a publicist by the name of Leslie Zimmerman, who's a close friend. I've worked with her for years. She's very you know, you know, skillful and knows her stuff. Worth taking some time to listen to that interview from Leslie 
Leslie Zimmerman as well. Um, what are the tools of the press person? Well, it's photos. They need photos to send out to everybody, right, Michelle? Yes, um, They'll typically, like now, to send a video. That wasn't always the case, but now that they can send a link to your video, they don't have to put it in an envelope. Whole different world. Bios, the bio is your official story of your record in your career, and oftentimes in some of those small cities, the bios get what gets published as the story, and somebody puts their name on it, right? Typically in the past, all that stuff had been assembled in press kits, no longer today. Today, your website is your, your, is your press list. So the big boys out there, the labels, they have in-house staffs that deal with all the stuff. And those people typically have deep connections at mainstream media, growing connections in all these new media outlets. Um, they have access to top writers. They have history with those top writers. When it comes to shooting photographs, they have you know, access in, in history with top photographers. They have the dollars to pay for those folks. They have the leverage with media outlets because they have 18 artists to talk about. So it's easy to slip in a Michelle writes and if they're going to if we're going to give them something on Madonna. Right. Um, they have the dollars to hire independent promotion people, independent publicists that an artist might want to have when they don't have the time to do it. What can you folks do? Well, I mentioned at the top here that it's a. The artists, they have this unique opportunity to tell their own story. And you start by writing your own bio. Um, you take your own photos, reference the Brantley Gutierrez advice. You use your website as your press kit today. Nobody wants to get a press kit today. Somebody wants to give me their stuff, I say, give me your email address, your website, and let me go there. <clears throat> um, you'll need to come up with that supply of items, just like the big labels. Um, you can go and find online contact lists that list all these blogs. We just bought one this morning. Cody and I for 150 bucks. It's got 2,200 blogs in every genre that you could possibly think of from big to small and everything in between, who the writers are, what their angle is on the blog, how to contact them, all important stuff. Um, as we mentioned here to Riley, those TV appearances that you may or may not be getting, but you might be able to get on Sofa or you might be able to get on Audiotree.tv and that's not going to take be the same as being on national TV, but it's a start. Um, Online marketing, that's the other major piece now of the, of the today's modern marketing plan. Uh, when I started, you know, uh, when I worked at a record label a few years back, you know, the online marketing was really like the ghetto of the record company. They have, typically had two geeky kids shoved down in a closet that had been turned into an office, and they were the digital marketing team. Now, it's mainstream. Almost everything we touch has a digital piece to it, whether it's the marketing, whether it's the distribution, whether it's the making of music, um, you know, all kinds of things all spin around this online world. It's also the place where most indie artists are on the most level playing field uh, with big major labels, right? And it's, it's cheap and it's effective and it's something you guys have to own. I'm convinced that artists today have to own the digital space. Michelle, you got a question? I a question, yes. Uh, NJ wants to know where can you buy a list with all the bloggers or how do you get in contact with all those people to... There is one. There is one we just bought today. What was it? Emily, I think her name is Emily Williams, right? And I kept getting this email and kept getting it and kept getting it and kept getting it. I was going to call her up and be cheap and just invite her <laughs> on the show to do an interview and see if I could get a freebie. But I folded and bought it today for 150 bucks. Um, get their email address. Michelle will send them a link to it. It's 150 Great. bucks. Um, pretty extensive list, wouldn't you say, Cud? Big. Cody was looking for some hip hop on his, when, he, when he moonlights. I don't know when that is that Cody <laughs> writes music since he spends most of his day with me. But he's in a hip hop kind of EDM type thing, and they were looking for some context. So I bought that list for Cody. To, let me give you a big hug, big yeah. fella. All right, there you go. Virtual five, five. Yeah. High five, Trojan, the Trojan love. Okay. Uh, online world. Okay. The centerpiece of your online world is what? You got it? Your website. Your website. Would you agree, Riley? Yes. Okay. Why is that? It's your storefront, right? Number one, if we're going to open up a store. We wanted to sell something. We'd have a store. Okay. Now maybe you could have it online, but even then you think about what your storefront looks like online, right? Um, it's also your broadcasting platform. I can do a TV show and put it, embed it right into my website. So it's not only my storefront, it's a broadcasting platform. Um, it's your market research tool. Every time somebody signs up on our website, gives me their email address and some information, it's providing me market research. When they go around 
around the site, if my developers do what they're supposed to do, I'll be able to tell what they're looking at, the things that they're interested in. And because of that, I'll be able to dial some things in, some promotions that allow people not only to, to talk about the music business, but to get involved with it. Um, it's also like your water cooler. It's a place you put together and you bring people to talk like we're doing today, taking questions and so forth. So your website is the centerpiece, if you're an indie artist, even a big artist, of your web operation and you need to treat it as such. Um, you have so many great tools out there on the web today. When I was in the business starting off, it was all about making a video for, for MTV, right? And if MTV didn't play your video, you were toast. Not today, you've got YouTube, it's your new MTV. But it's also your TV station. I can stream shows directly to YouTube, right? Um, it's a radio station for people that just wanna listen to that song with the visual up there that doesn't move cheap video. They're not really into the video, they're there to listen to the song. Um, it's a place where you can store all your video content without having to worry about server costs, right? SoundCloud's another great place. It's a place where you can present your music and get input, right? People can not only listen to, they can tell you what parts they like. They can give you research on where they're from, male, female, age, all of that stuff, right? Um, that's all part of this new online tool set you have. Social media, wow, social media, it's where the conversation with your audience happens. You get feedback from them, you get involvement from them. So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, these are all great tools for people that are looking to engage with their audience, whether it starts with, I started with 10 Twitter followers, we're up to 21,000. We started with no YouTube followers, we're up to almost 4,000. I, 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 I long for those 600,000 I see, or a million, five million I see on some <laughs> sites. But the bottom line is that every person that we get in our little world is somebody that we can talk to. I think the key for social media is finding out which one of those tricks work for you. So if you're an artist and you're not really chatty like me, but you like pictures that tell a story, maybe you're Brandon Boyd and you like to take pictures and you put them on Pinterest or on Tumblr or whatever it might be, um, that could work for you. If you're, if you like to talk a lot like me, you know, Facebook and Twitter are great tools, you know. Uh, if you like to give people a little look behind the scenes, our Instagram account, I, I go to our Instagram account all the time just to kind of reminisce about all the folks we've had on the site and, and look at great pictures of my dogs and kids growing up. So anyway, if you want some thoughts about how to master that social media spin, I want you to go check out our interview with a lady by the name of Rachel Masters, who's my social media maven. I met her when I managed Incubus. She helped us pull together our social media strategy from nowhere to somewhere. Really, really smart lady and somebody I talk to all the time to try to figure out what's what I should be doing. Uh, okay, let's move on. Radio, big part of the marketing plan for years in the record business, still a big part of it. It's all about getting your music heard, isn't it? You'd like to have those songs be heard, wouldn't you, Michelle? I would certainly It's one thing to write them. It's, I can <laughs> remember every time I heard an Incubus song on the radio for the first time, you'd hear it in the studio forever. You'd hear 18 freaking incarnations of it. You'd marry one, they'd change something, you'd hate it, and you'd <laughs> back and forth. And then finally it got on the radio, and it was like, oh my God, we'd be calling, hey man, I heard it on the radio, right? There was nothing like it. So getting your music heard is still the, 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 just the, the ultimate payoff. Um, where do you get your music heard in today's world? Well, you know, typically it used to be commercial radio. Pop radio, K Rock here in LA, whatever your whatever your your you know favorite you know genre of music is, country or otherwise, you typically heard it on the radio. That's where it was pounded into your head. Um, if you couldn't get on commercial radio, you would talk to the public radio stations. Here in LA, we have a great NPR station called KCRW. Very much the tastemakers because they don't have to worry about selling. Their, they, they can be very precious, but they tend to be on the cutting edge of stuff. And so if you couldn't get on commercial radio, you were happy as heck to get on KCRW. Um, if you couldn't get on the public radio stations, you were happy to get on college radio stations, which even though it was only maybe at one campus, there were tastemakers, influencers that could help spread the word so that's that was the old days today whole different animal you got satellite radio 
I find myself listening to serious radio all day long, all different kinds of genres from hip hop nation to country this to, to alt nation to serious XMU, all of those things. You have online radio stations. All the terrestrial stations, the K-Rocks, also have an online component of their radio station. So if I'm in South America and I want to hear what's going on in my local commercial radio station, what do I do? I go online and listen to it. Wasn't there you know, years ago. It's there now. It's part of it. All these streaming services, Spotify, RDO, you know, you know, too many for me to remember here today. Um, you know, they're all Slacker Radio. All of those things are out there that weren't there today. And there are also in other places that you can hear uh, your music. And finally, on all those on-demand services like Spotify, where you can type in your favorite act and almost every band in the world is on there. These are great new outlets to hear music. The big boys, the record labels, um, typically have handled this because they had a staff of in-house promotion people, typically separated by genre. Um, I'll come to that question. And all those folks had big, kind of, big contacts at commercial radio stations. They also had the money to hire independent promotion people. Question, Michelle? Yeah. Derek Tucker wants to know, what's the best format to send your single to college radio? The digital versus physical copy version. Which one do you think is better? I think that as time goes on, there are probably still some old school folks <laughs> that like to get it on CD. And I'll tell you why. They like to take it home and listen to it in the car. But I'm betting any 20-year-old college kid out there has figured out how to put it somewhere else on his... Yeah phone or somewhere else and he's going to plug it into his car. Um, so I think there may still be some people that like to get the physical CD, but I'm betting that number is yeah. dwindling and every and I'm 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 one of those grizzly old veterans. Don't send me a CD, send me links, man. Okay? Yeah. So, I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, so what can you folks do when it comes to radio? Commercial radio um, unless you're going to write a check, unless you have a burning hot single, it's typically going to be out of your reach, but I'll tell you one, one exclusion to that. Almost every big radio station, certainly on the rock side, whether it's Sunday night at 12 o'clock in the morning or 1 o'clock in the morning, have a local radio show, right? And over the years, there's been a number of big songs that started on a local radio show. I recall the fray in, in uh, Denver started on a local radio show. I can remember hearing a band called Drama Rama that I ultimately wound up managing years ago. Heard it on local radio, but it was on the new music hour. So that's the place in the commercial world that you can get to. And they typically have somebody at the station, not the program, director that's handling that. So that's one place to go. Uh, public radio, easier to find those people. They don't take independent promotion money and that kind of stuff. So you have a better shot of somebody just loving your music there and not asking, hey, are you going on tour? Are you buying, doing a radio ad buy and all that stuff? And finally, the, the new ones, the digital aggregators, you know, these digital distribution services like TuneCore, uh, and InGrooves, and there's a number of others out there, uh, will put you in all of these streams streaming services, Spotify, RDO, and lots of these places because they take that digital file and they send it to all the retailers and all the streaming sites. So that's what you guys can do. How do you find them? Do a little homework online. It's that simple. But these are the things you can do typically without writing a big check because if you go into commercial radio at almost any format, you're writing a check to get there. Um, RMB resources, Red Man Music Business resources. We have some interviews with folks from TuneCore, Jeff Price, CD Baby, Kevin Bruner, In Grooves, a uh, gal by the name of Liz Lowry that talk about their services and what they can do to help you get into all these places. They're not the only answers. They're just some cool folks that we've had a chance to talk to. And even if you didn't use them, they'd get you up to speed on what you can expect there. Um, distribution. Okay, you've got some great music. People are hearing about it. They're hearing it on the radio. How am I going to buy this thing? What's worse than hearing about something you can't buy it i read about this cool apple computer the one in the circle at christmas and you still can't buy this thing i'm almost over it so distribution is all about getting your music into the hands of your consumers um, the typical outlets in the past have been physical outlets first in my day tower records and big record retailers that's all they did was record retailing they went by the wayside at the dawn of the digital revolution and it became places like target best buy and walmart 
even those folks have lost their steam for new music. There are still indie record stores out there, folks, that are real people that are owned not by some big company, but by people who love music. And the reason I mention that is because those are stores that you can still get your music into if you're going to go make those physical CDs and stuff. Uh, you've got all these digital outlets now, iTunes being the 800 pound gorilla, where you know 90% of the digital sales are happening through iTunes now. There's others, Amazon's, there's hundreds of actual e, you know, electronic retailers out there, but everybody knows iTunes. And finally, there are lots of people that think these streaming services like Spotify and, and Pandora and so forth are also retail outlets because instead of getting your money when somebody bought your record, you get some money every time it's played. And unlike when you buy a record, if I play it a million times, I only get paid once. Whereas if somebody kept playing your songs on these streaming services, you do get some money. So I won't go into how much you get to pay it, except to say those are the new distribution outlets. What can you do to address those places? Um, you can focus on the digital side to that person's question earlier today. Um, you know, if you have a limited budget and you don't have money to manufacture, you know, and carry inventory for CDs and vinyl, um, you can focus on those indie retailers because if you're a hot act in your market that's developed a local following that might be getting some airplay on the local show, a local retailer may be able to go out and take 50 of your records and actually sell them because now somebody's got demand and you got a place to, 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 to sell them, right? Um, you can sell your CDs or coupons to a digital buy at your gigs. And if you're not doing that, I'm going to ask you why, right? Um, if you set up your website and you believe that's your storefront, why wouldn't you sell from there as well? So those are the new things you can do to sell today that don't require a ton of money. Questions? Oh. Yes. Riley. Uh, God, I love you, Riley, the way you just <laughs> jump in there. You're going to be a fine manager, Riley. Thank you. Um, so I guess my question is, if we're willing to spend a certain amount of money on online promotion, what should we spend that money on? Should we spend it on boosting Facebook posts or advertisements or like a, maybe working with a third party online to promote our content? Do you have any advice for that? Uh, it's a great question. It's something we go through every day here at Rem Man MB. In some ways, I kid around that this is like if I had started a band, this is what it would be. Um, <laughs> You know, I have dabbled with boosting Facebook posts just to get it in front of more people. Um, we've we've played around with you know boosted posts on Twitter, um, you know, and and had some success. You know, where the numbers go up, but you know, I, I I'm still not certain what it gets me, but it definitely gets yeah. you more traffic. Um, we we've doing something revolutionary here, you know. And if you're a TV station, you got a brand new show or a great piece of content. Uh, nobody would think twice if you were out there promoting it, right, and advertising yeah. it places, right? So we started to do the same thing with some of our content because I got so tired of listening to people send me an email going, God, well, this is the greatest interview I've ever seen. How come it only got a thousand views, right? And it was because, you know, we were counting on the viral side alone to make it happen. So I think the moral of the story is if you have some money to spend, um, the online advertising world is becoming a real medium to advertise. Um, I'll say from my own experience that it's still a bit of the Wild West and I'm learning, but I think it's, I, 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 every day, when I'm done tonight, I'll be spending more time trying to figure out have we done it the right way. Okay, and I'll keep reporting back to you. Michelle, you got yes, a question. Does that help you out there you. a little bit? But I'm yeah. going to come back Thanks. to you later on if you have some money to spend on some help. Go ahead, Michelle. All right, we got a question from Derek Tucker saying, can you buy product placement and advanced marketing on Spotify or iTunes, or is that only for the majors? It's money. They'll take your money. You know, I think if you're talking about front racked, it, you know, on the, when you go to that right. page on iTunes, that's like the old record stores. But can you if you pay it, them a crap load of money? Yes. <laughs> money talks and, and cool gets a place at the table, but that's somebody else's decision. If you have money to spend, you can spend it. You can spend it on YouTube views. Right. You could sit there and buy ads if you wanted to pay the price and go, here's what my music is. Here's all the artists that I think my music is like. So you, if you had the money, you could go put a spot on Rihanna video, right? And, and, but it, that's where you start to get into some big money there. I'll tell you that. But yes, you can, um, and you should just call up those folks and ask them. There's all kinds of different ways to do it I'm, I'm coming to find. You had a question there, Nate? Yeah. Oh, no, okay, all right, great. Um, all right, so 
let's see, what can we do? Okay, we talked about, okay, new tools. Um, we're going to wrap this up here in a little bit. Um, new tools. There are so many great new tools out there to help you get your job done. Uh, and we featured a bunch of them here on the site. Um, Cody's been flashing a link about our artist tools. If you go to our homepage, on the feed there, you'll see a, a link to where it says Artist Tools over there, right? Right over Jack Antonoff's head. If you click there, you're going to get a chance to see a lot of these new tools that we've talked about, whether it's SoundCloud, CD Baby, Audio Tree, uh, you know, Spotify, all these folks that we've had a chance to spotlight on the show that provide you with some wonderful new tools that, weren't, that didn't exist in the past. And I encourage you to spend some time there. Uh, that's not everything by any stretch of the imagination, just the things that we thought were cool. And once we get done doing this Renman MB series, we're going to start going out and highlighting some new uh, features and some new tools that we've spotted out there that we think can help you do a better job of promoting your music there. Um, now, Riley, you mentioned something. I'm going to close on this. You'd mentioned if we had some money to spend, where might we spend it? I'm going to give you a, a little bit of experience that I've had. Okay. Um, I talk about it all the time. You know, the, the bitch about his experience is that it takes time to get it. And when you're young and impatient, you know, you really you want to get that knowledge right now. If you don't have experience and you have some money, you can actually buy some experience. And here's what I'm talking about. Um, if you want, if you have some money and you believe in your product and you are ready, committed to it all the way, you might be thinking about how do I get more press for my friend in the band, right? And so you might be thinking about hiring an indie publicist that actually has contacts, that has deep relationships in big media outlets at the key blogs and so forth. Because what I know as a veteran in the business is this idea of who you know is hugely important. People don't like to talk about it, but it's true. It's why most of the big managers are not 20 year olds, no offense. <laughs> not that you won't get there, right? It's because they have experience and they have contacts. And we talked about all that stuff in terms of building your professional team, right? So if you wanted to go out and hire an indie publicist, that would be one of the key people I'd have on our team. And when Brandon Boyd put out a solo record and we did it not on a major label, but we did it independently, it was distributed through in grooves. And I hired an independent publicist. Now, I won't tell you what we paid them, but I'll tell you that a good publicist can run anywhere between $1,000 to $5,000 a month plus expenses. Um, the good ones are really picky because they want to win. They want, they want artists that they believe they can have some success with, right? Um, yeah. So they'll be choosy, but that's something to consider if you really have a story to tell, right? The other one that is an important part of it, if you worked at a record label, or if you folks were putting out a record on a record label, the first thing they'd do would be assign you a product manager. And that product manager would be the person that lords over this marketing plan, right? That puts it together, puts it in writing, holds everybody's you know, feet to the fire to make sure it's happening, right? And in today's world, there are lots of former marketing people that worked at big labels who are extremely qualified, you know, hugely talented, that have been laid off off in the contraction of the business. There's, there's some really great ones out there. And when we did an independent record, I hired an independent marketing person who became, my, in effect, my head of marketing. Those folks can run from $1,500 to $10,000 a month. People that can help you get on the front page of iTunes, that can help you get a promotion with Spotify, that can help you with all that big picture stuff that the labels typically take care of. So I think if you're looking to do this and you have a little money, to spend, that's something to think about if you really believe you got something, you can't do that stuff yourself, right? Um, yeah. I'll tell you the other greatest source of help out there, and then I'm gonna end with this, is your fans, okay? Um, over the years with our Incubus fans, I had so many people that would help me with graphics, that would help me with almost anything just because they love what the band was doing. We've had the same thing happen here. We've had so many great virtual interns here, and we'd invite you to be one of them, right? That's yeah. how I met Cody Romnus. It's you know how I met Michelle Wrights, and people that have come in here because they love it, right? that are willing to help out, you know, and obviously it doesn't last forever, but for those people, um, they get some gratification out of it and, and it works for everybody. So, you know, when you're thinking about who can help you get to where you need to be, don't forget the people that are your biggest supporters. You'll be shocked at how much they'll do for you and how good they feel about it and how good you feel about having them be a part of it, all right? Michelle's giving me that look over there. It's going to make me freaking cry here. Cody, get the camera off me right now, okay? 
<laughs> All right, so I'm going to recap because it's getting late here. Marketing and promotion, folks, if I haven't convinced you yet, maybe it's, I've missed the whole point. Marketing promotion is hugely important. Once you've made that music, the decisions you make next are going to have a huge impact on the ultimate outcome of that. Understanding how marketing and promotion works is important because you're beginning, in the beginning of your career, it's most likely you are going to be the marketing department. It's not, it's okay to sit there and be in your bubble when you're making the music, but if you come out and go, well, I don't know about any of that stuff, <laughs> the music that you slaved over there won't have a chance in the real world. Whether your goal is to build your own career or ultimately to sign to the label. The work you'll do along the way will go a huge way in terms of painting the image of your music and artistry so that when you get there, Michelle or Riley, when your friend gets there, or one of the folks who was asking a question, you will have already fine-tuned your image in a way that speaks to who you really are. And that's what, remember, honest, be who you are, find out your vibe and go with it. Um, take the time to do it right because first impressions the old saying is true, first impressions are very powerful, so get it right. Um, while you're on the way, do what my friend Riley's doing here. Ask questions, do your homework, and then once you've got a plan, get on with it. That's my advice to you. Um, next week, we're going to talk about record labels. We talked this week about everything, all the big marketing elements that you need to think about. That's all the stuff that goes on in a label. Next week, I'm going to take it, uh, talk about labels in a slightly different focus. We'll talk about what they do, who does it inside those companies, how to approach a label about how to get signed, and once you get signed, how to work that team to get the most out of them for you and them. Uh, my name is Steve. Steve Rennie, I want to thank Michelle for joining us. I want to thank the team here, Matt Rennie, Cody, Code Red, Cody Cohen, Cody Ramos, my friend Nathan. Riley, I want to thank you for joining us. Any final questions? I do not have any other questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Nathan's got one final question. Just, uh, once you find the blogger, how do you recommend contacting or wording the email? You know, that's something you just have to figure out. I'll say make it personal, okay? If people feel you're being honest, what you might lack in, you know, in smoothness or skill, I think you make up for in sincerity, you know? And uh, some people are better at writing letters than others. Maybe you have a friend of yours. Tell them what you want, and they can help you craft a letter. I think the key is when you're contacting people in general in the music business, be professional, be to the point, make sure you ask them to do what you want them to do, and be willing to follow up. that answer the question? Yeah. All right, great. All right, thanks a lot for joining us here tonight. My name is Steve Rennie. This is Renman MB slash Renman U. We'll see you next Wednesday.